Well, hello everyone. Fancy meeting you here. Today, uh, you don't have to code a class, but you do have to listen to this, so, you know, fair is fair, right? So today we're going to talk about um, aneurysms and some uh, itises, endocarditis, pericarditis, myocarditis. You're going to love it. So let's start with the story of Walter White, who's a 50-year-old chemistry teacher and a lifelong smoker. He presents to the emergency department of a community hospital with severe tearing pain in his chest and back. He's diaphoretic, we already mentioned that's a bad sign, and he has this sense of impending doom, also a very ominous sign. The nurse puts him uh, in a trauma bay and immediately calls for the attending while she gets vitals and does an EKG. Blood pressure is 200 over 110, heart rate's 100, respirators are 16. Chest x-ray done uh, right away shows widening of the mediastinum. Cardiogram looks like this. Um, there's some uh, ST depression, T wave inversion, some ST elevation in the inferior leads. Kind of doesn't make sense for um, uh, an acute MI because of the uh, uh, non-specific uh, changes. So cardiology is called for a stat transesophageal echocardiogram. Meanwhile, Mr. White's given morphine without relief. He then develops some slurred speech. Cardiology arrives and performs a transesophageal echo, which reveals a type A dissection. We're going to talk about that today. The tertiary facility is notified and arrangements are made to fly the patient to have emergency surgery. So, aneurysms, and in this case a thoracic aneurysm, uh, aneurysms are very worrisome things. One of the reasons that they're so worrisome is that people die from them very readily. Um, they are a severe injury, of course, um, but at the same time, they're kind of hard to diagnose. If you show up in the emergency room with um, chest pain and shortness of breath, you get a cardiologist. If you show up with uh, cough and shortness of breath, you get a pulmonologist. There's somebody in charge of the lungs. There's somebody in charge of the heart. Nobody's in charge of the aorta. That's the funny thing. There is no aortologist who's called uh, when somebody shows up with a, a, an injury to their aorta. So let's talk about pathophysiology. There, uh, a few years ago, the latest that we have data for, there were 17,000 deaths uh, from aneurysms. Um, they are, th there is a uh, genetic predisposition, and sometimes they can be congenital. Um, genetic predispositions occur, um, the, the one that we think of most is, um, is with people like Abe Lincoln who have Marfan syndrome. Uh, trauma, smoking, big time smoking risk, uh, hypertension, aging, diabetes, all these things can lead to the formation of aneurysms. And in fact, it's really just atherosclerosis that causes this. But it sort of takes a different form than the traditional atherosclerosis that we've talked about uh, or that you've talked about in the past with coronary disease and such. Uh, in this case, the same kind of thing happens. There's some injury to the endothelial layer here. Monocytes migrate to the site. There's smooth muscle proliferation. Sim simultaneously, there's this fatty deposit being created here uh, in, the, in between the media and the um, intima. And that is what we know as uh, an atheroma. And so this atheroma can actually weaken the arterial wall. And what happens is that you may end up uh, either rupturing that or getting a dissection. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But first of all, I want you to think about, um, you know, which of these is really um, the worst? So, you know, you can have aneurysms in any arter artery or arteriole in the body. Uh, and when we talk about thoracic aneurysms, we talk about them being above the diaphragm. And when we talk about um, abdominal aneurysms, we talk about them as being either suprarenal, that is above the renal arteries, or infrarenal below the uh, renal arteries. So I'm curious why, uh, or which one do you think is worse and why? 
Well, they're both bad, obviously. But the uh, infrarenal ones are a little less bad because they don't threaten kidney flow as much as the uh, suprarenal ones. So if you imagine the uh, aneurysm being here, suprarenally, it could dissect downward and uh, disrupt blood flow here. Now, certainly it could dissect and uh, go upward, but that's much less common. So typically the infrarenal ones uh, are, um, I don't want to say better, but they're, they're typically not as worrisome as the suprarenal ones. So one of the things that can happen with an aneurysm is it can rupture. That's usually catastrophic. The thing, uh, you know, there's this ballooning of the arterial wall, and uh, at some point it begins leaking, ruptures, there's a ton of blood loss, and you bleed out within a minute or so. Dead, not much that can be done about it. More typically, a dissection occurs. Now think about the word dissection and what you did in anatomy lab with uh, whatever animal you had, probably a pig or a cat. Um, and when you dissected, what you did was separate things, right? Well, separation is exactly what happens with a dissection of an aneurysm. And the thing that separates is the intima, this part of the artery wall, with the media which is this part of the artery wall. And in fact, what has happened here is this intimal section that you see pictured right here has separated from this part. And so now there's a false channel and looking from above, we can see the blood goes into this false lumen and goes into the true lumen here. So that's what a dissection is. It's not a rupture. That's a very different process. Rupture is usually catastrophic, can't be survived um, when it's out of hospital, and uh, dissection usually causes this ripping, tearing pain uh, as that dissection occurs. But this can be a stable uh, process and, can, uh, and, and you can survive it. So the way we classify this uh, is now with the Stanford method. It's either a type A dissection if it involves the A sending a, uh, aorta or it's a type B dissection if it involves the D sending aorta. It used to be that we used this DeBakey system with one, two, and three and it got a little confusing and this is uh, this involves the anterior or the A sending but it doesn't involve the arch. Does that matter? Well when it's uh, when there's a false lumen and the descending, it, it just got too complicated. So they came up with the type A and type B. And the important thing to know is that when you have a type A dissection, it involves the ascending aneurysm. I'm sorry, it involves the ascending aorta. And when it involves the ascending aorta, it can involve the coronary arteries that come off right here and right here. It could also involve the valve. This is the aortic valve, of course. So type A dissections um, are worrisome for that reason. It also can involve the great vessels that come off of the aorta here. But as you can see, a type, C, uh, a type B dissection can also involve those. So, uh, so the distinction is that a type A dissection involves the ascending aorta. Type B dissection just involves the descending. So there are other reasons that you should be nervous about thoracic aneurysms. Uh, we talked about two here, the aortic valve, the coronary artery um, involvement. You could also have a pericardial tamponade where there's a little leak into the pericardium and that pericardium holds that blood and sort of um, prevents more blood from leaking out. So you get a little time um, and you don't die suddenly, but that tamponading, that um, pressure on the outside of the heart uh, within the pericardial space can limit blood flow out, can limit filling, limits blood flow going out. So tamponade is a dangerous thing and that can be um, that can be something that kills you as well. Paraplegia, there is uh, there are spinal arteries that come off of the thoracic aorta and that uh, can certainly cause 
ischemia and loss of function of the spine. You can have vocal cord paralysis uh, and of course the extension of the dissection can go all the way down through the aorta. So awful, awful sequela, uh, awful side effects from uh, tampa or from uh, aortic dissection. Now the assessment of this uh, problem can include any of these or all of these. First of all, you can have an aneurysm that is uh, asymptomatic. You can have an aneurysm and not know it. And in fact, that's how uh, that's how they start. People are asymptomatic for a period of time until it either ruptures or dissects. So there are other times that it can become symptomatic. You know, you could get some hoarseness, you could have some fullness, you could have some other weird symptom, or more frequently, it's discovered by accident uh, on some CAT scan or something like that. And um, that's a preference, right? We'd like to discover it early rather than at the time that you're having the dissection. Uh, Symptoms, again, this tearing back pain uh, at the level of the aneurysm is very worrisome. And then associated symptoms like lung, uh, you know, pulmonary congestion, if there's leaking of that aortic valve, uh, you could have an acute aortic regurgitation murmur where that uh, valve just isn't competent in holding the blood in the aorta. Uh, if there's an abdominal aneurysm, then you could certainly palpate that uh, aneurysm as well when you assess a patient. And there's a specific skill for doing that uh, that I'd be happy to show you if you're uh, interested. Extremities, uh, blood pressure and pulse differentials. So if you take the uh, blood pressure in the arm and take the, uh, I'm sorry, you take the blood pressure in each arm, if there's a difference there, then that could be because of uh, an aneurysm or some other reason for limited blood flow in that extremity. Diagnostic tests, we're getting back to my old favorite, right? Echocardiography is uh, simple. It's uh, easy to visualize. Everybody can interpret it. Um, it. It doesn't require some specialized knowledge that only two people in the world have. So it's a very convenient test. Um, there's other tests, though. CT angiography can be done. Magnetic resonance uh, angiography, or MRA, can be done. Uh, and then the old-fashioned aortogram, where you put a catheter into the aorta, you squirt dye in there, and you take pictures. Any of those could be done. For the abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, this is located below the uh, diaphragm in the belly. Then you certainly could do an ultrasound. Um, same as an echo, right? It's just that uh, when we do it of the heart, we call it an echo. When we do it uh, in the abdomen, we call it an ultrasound. Uh, again, though, CT angio, MRA, aortogram can also be done. Now, one thing is also, or this other thing is also true. If you suspect an aneurysm, um, you have to keep doing the test, uh, doing tests in order to get to the bottom of it. So it may be that one of these tests doesn't show it. It may be that the TEE isn't sensitive enough to show that particular thing, then you would need to take the next step. But that's more for physicians to worry about. So what are the treatments? Well, the medical treatment, right, this is non-surgical. Medical treatment involves aggressive blood pressure control. You want to get that blood pressure under control as much as possible so that the aneurysm doesn't continue to dissect. Beta blockers are a big part of that. And then, of course, careful monitoring if this is discovered as an outpatient. Surgical uh, intervention is usually required, and certainly if there's a dissection, uh, we get the surgeons involved right away. Sometimes they take them to the operating room, sometimes they don't. Um, it's a difficult thing to know whether they need surgery or not, and it's sort of beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about. But surgery um, is a definitive treatment, and uh, either dissection or rupture are indications for emergency surgery. Now, the other thing is that if you have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, for instance, and we measure it, it should not be more than four, uh, the aorta should not be more than four centimeters. If it's more than four centimeters, then we follow it very carefully. Um, and if it grows to be over five centimeters, or if it's more than a half a centimeter of growth per year, then they uh, operate on it before it becomes um, 
you know, a, a higher risk for rupture or dissection. So what's the post-op care of somebody with uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Well, you have to worry about all those abdominal surgery considerations, right? You got the bowel that doesn't work, uh, early mobilization, getting people up out of beds, very important, uh, pain control, um, uh, splinting of their belly as they cough and take deep breaths. Those are all important uh, nursing considerations for us. The thoracic aneurysm uh, also has the um, the considerations for thoracic surgery. So, you know, good pulmonary toilet. Um, you also have to remember that cardiopulmonary bypass may be done. And remember what we talked about with cardiopulmonary bypass before. We talked about that phenomenon of pump head where people are um, using uh, or, or having difficulty concentrating uh, for even up to a year after surgery. So there's those things to be concerned about as well. There's also, uh, with the thoracic aneurysm repair, there's a risk of vocal cord paralysis and paraplegia. Again, the uh, arteries that come off of the aorta that feed the spine uh, can, uh, can be affected during the cross clamp. So when they do this operation, they need a bloodless field during the repair of the aneurysm. So they cross clamp the aorta so that no blood um, gets past the... Um, site that they're operating on and during that time there's no blood getting to the spine so that can cause uh, paralysis and there's a very short window that they have to complete that part of the operation if I'm not mistaken it's around 14 minutes or so uh, so you know it's a, it's a rather tense time during that operation so that's what I want you to know about uh, aneurysms. Again, remember that rupture is not the same as um, as a dissection. The dissection is the separating of the media from the intima and causing a false channel to happen there, where the blood goes in between the media and the um, uh, the intima. Next, we're going to talk about endocarditis. So endo means inside, and card means heart, and itis means inflammation. So this is an inflammation inside the heart, and it's it doesn't sound like it, but what we're really talking about is an infection of the valve. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so endocarditis um, sometimes goes like this. The family of a 64-year-old woman uh, that I took care of once... Um, the patient was otherwise in good health. The family called 911 she, when she was in responsive, unresponsive in bed in the morning. She was taken to the emergency department and a large ischemic stroke was noted on CT. So she was intubated, mechanically ventilated, taken to the ICU. Uh, I met her there and uh, interestingly she had a fever of 38.8. Um, there was also a murmur that I heard when I examined her, and she had these hot reddened areas on her left knee and her left wrist. So those things all together uh, added up in my mind to endocarditis, right? So you have um, this growth growing on the valve, which causes, let me go back on that slide, uh, and that growth on the valve causes the valve to disintegrate, and so there's this uh, murmur that you hear as the valve, uh, as the blood flows across the valve. Um, she had a fever, so she probably had some sort of infection, right? And then, interestingly, you had these two hot red areas uh, on her knee and her wrist. And when you touch them, they were uh, just red hot and sort of weird. So when you put all that stuff together, you kind of think, well, it sounds like they probably had a, um, you know, something growing on the valve that cut loose, went to the brain, gave her a stroke, went to the knee and to the wrist, and gave her these things that we call septic emboli. So what happens when you have a valvular abnormality? Now, before it gets infected, um, valves don't just get infected by themselves they get infected because there's an abnormality present and that abnormality causes this turbulent flow so instead of this normal laminar flow that you see pictured here you get this um, 
goober or some sort of lesion on the valve that causes turbulent blood flow to happen. So as this blood flows across this um, goober or this um, um, blockage or what have you, uh, this irregularity, it causes the blood to get turb uh, turbulent. The blood flow becomes turbulent and when that happens this blood falls back onto the valve again and sort of circles around and so there's more time for um, infection if there's infection or in the blood if there are bacteria in the blood there's more time for the bacteria to stick to the valve because it's in contact with the valve more does that make sense it's um it, it it's because of this turbulent blood flow that these valves can become infected. But remember, there has to be a valve abnormality to begin with, whether there's thickening of the valve, whether there's leaking of the valve, or what have you. So who's at highest risk? The person at highest risk for endocarditis is someone who's previously had endocarditis. Not only do they have an abnormal valve, but they also have proven to everybody that they have the potential to have a valve infection. Not everybody with an abnormal valve gets a valve infection, right? But people who've had endocarditis previously are people who are likely to have it again. Anybody with an abnormal or prosthetic heart valve, as we talked about. People who are IV drug abusers. And by the way, IV drug abusers are the only people, really, who get tricuspid valve endocarditis. Think about that for a second. Usually, um, non-drug non -drug abusers get uh, left-sided valve problems, aortic and mitral valve problems. But in people who are IV drug abusers, um, the tricuspid valve is often affected. Um, people who have congenital heart disease are also at risk. Any implanted device in the heart uh, and any hemodialysis or central venous catheter puts people at risk for endocarditis. As I said, most often the mitral valve is uh, affected and the aortic is a close second, so those two on the left side, because the pressures are higher, the flow differentials are greater, there's more turbulence of blood flow across those abnormal valves, and all that stuff together adds up to those being more likely to be involved. On the right side, lower pressure system, um, less turbulent blood flow, but um, if you're injecting drugs and bacteria into your arm, the first place it stops is the tricuspid valve. Okay? We almost never see pulmonic valve um, being involved. The diagnosis of endocarditis is a hard one to make. And so the guys at Duke many years ago came up with these criteria that they use to uh, make the diagnosis. And it turns out that, you know, there's all these little uh, criteria, these little Janeway lesions and Osler's nodes and all these funny little things that you can find on physical exam. Um, they really are very poor predictors of people having endocarditis. What is a good predictor, uh, or what are good predictors, are these two. Uh, so if you have both of these major criteria, that is evidence of blood cult uh, positive blood cultures and evidence of endocardial involvement by echo, those two things together um, mean that you have endocarditis. Now, if you have um, minor criteria, then it becomes more complicated and, uh, and it's a bigger challenge to figure out. But positive blood cultures with evidence of endocardial involvement on echo, done deal, you have endocarditis. So what are the complications of endocarditis? Well, we talked about one of them, the septic emboli that happen. So if the uh, embolus, uh, I'm sorry, if the um, bacteria on the valve, this vegetation, uh, breaks off and goes in the bloodstream, it could go to the brain, give you a, a septic embolus to the brain, could go to the knee, it could go to the wrist as it did with this partic uh, particular patient, could go to any part of the body that gets arterial blood flow, right? Other things that can happen are heart block where um, the valve infection, say if, if it's the aortic valve for instance, that valve infection can uh, go into the uh, aortic root 
or the place where the aortic valve attaches to the heart. Uh, and that, as the infection eats through there, can give you heart block. Heart failure, and heart block, by the way, is electrical, right? So uh, it means that the heart rate slows down, uh, and the top part of the heart doesn't talk to the bottom part of the heart electrically. Heart failure is another thing that can happen. When you have heart failure, uh, it's usually because of um, backward leaking of the blood from the aortic valve or the mitral valve. Um, uh, so it's usually regurgitant lesions that are the concern. These are some of those uh, findings that we talked about. Uh, conjunctival hemorrhages here, splinter hemorrhages, um, I happen to have splinter hemorrhages in my fingers from time to time. I don't have endocarditis. So this is another one of those reasons that, uh, that these physical findings are not always uh, very useful. But they're part of the whole story, right? So if you have Osler's nodes like this and Janeway lesions like this, uh, along with other things that make you concerned, um, then, you know, it's part of the entire picture. Again, the diagnostic test is the echocardiogram or transesophageal echo. On your slide deck, you can click on this TEE button and you'll see a uh, video of that uh, transesophageal echo showing this little vegetation, or big vegetation right here. So this is a big vegetation on the aortic valve uh, that you can watch move back and forth. So the diagnostic criteria uh, include blood cultures, and when we do blood cultures, we get two sets of blood cultures 20 minutes apart at separate uh, sites daily anytime there's a f uh, fever spike. And again, we typically do these before we start people on antibiotics because we want to make sure that we've identified the organism that we're treating. So if you show up and you have, uh, you know, a skin infection, you got a thing on your finger, um, we pretty much know that that's probably staph and we can treat it with, uh, you know, an antibiotic that'll get that staph organism and we don't really have to culture most of those. Um, similarly, if you show up with a sore throat or an earache, we know just based on empiric evidence which uh, antibiotic to use. With endocarditis, we don't. It could be caused by any number of things. It could be caused by an organism in the mouth, and the one that we see most often is uh, uh, strep viridans. And it could be caused by um, E. coli. It could be caused by enterococcus. It could be caused by any number of organisms, each of which has a different treatment regimen. So it's really, really important that we try and get a good culture that gives us uh, definitive evidence of what we're treating so that we can treat it definitively. So the treatment, um, the medical treatment is long-term antibiotics with a PICC line, and that means that uh, it's going to be at least six weeks of antibiotics. Um, we don't treat endocarditis with a quick, you know, 10-day course of PO antibiotics. It's always IV, and it's always for an extended period of time. We always use culture and sensitivity CNS-guided antibiotic therapy, as we just discussed. There is surgical uh, treatment, and in fact, there's a big discussion going on in the literature right now, and they go back and forth on it all the time, about whether you do early valve replacement, or if you try and put them on antibiotics for six weeks and sterilize that, um, and then try and operate on them. There's a big debate about that, and I don't know where that's going to fall out, obviously, um, but there are more and more people uh, opting for early replacement. The challenge there is that surgeons are afraid, you know, if you replace the valve early and there's still infection going on in there, you put a new valve in that same place, is the new valve going to get infected? And if it does, that's a really big deal. A really big deal. When you have uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis, um, that is a very serious thing. Um, so, there's no disagreement that when you have somebody who is hemodynamically unstable, you always operate on that. 
So anybody who has severe acute regurgitation, uh, if they have that aortic root abscess that we talked about that could cause heart block, for instance, any of those are reasons to uh, really do the surgery right away. Um, so there's this thing called endocarditis prophylaxis. And when you're about to have a procedure that we know puts people at risk for endocarditis, we give them antibiotics beforehand. So if you meet these criteria, you have a prosthetic valve, you have that history of endocarditis, which by the way, remember, it's the number one predictor of whether you're going to have endocarditis again. Uh, or if you have congenital heart disease, or if you have a heart transplant with some sort of valve problem post-transplant. You know, maybe you have some aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis or whatever. Uh, usually it's mitral regurgitation that those people tend to have, but regardless, any valvulopathy. If you have any of these conditions, then you need to get uh, antibiotics before dirty procedures. And dirty procedures are most dental procedures, including getting your teeth cleaned. In fact, we know that um, during a day, you have multiple times during the day when you have um, bacteremia or bacteria in your blood from your mouth. And so if you're going to do something that we know is going to put bacteria in your blood, uh, then we want to prevent that from causing an infection. So any dental procedures, including just teeth cleaning. Uh, respiratory procedures with uh, biopsy of the mucosa. So if there's ever going to be a biopsy um, of, of some respiratory ailment, then we want to get uh, we want to get those people covered. Uh, surgery on infected soft tissue, and then certainly a cystoscopy, uh, whether they have a known UTI or not. Those are all reasons to do uh, endocarditis prophylaxis, and there's specific antibiotics that are recommended in those situations. So that's endocarditis. Now we're going to talk about pericarditis. And remember, pericarditis is inflammation of the sac around the heart called the pericardium. And that has a, a feature that we can see right here. And oops, sorry, so going back, uh, this arrow is actually pointing to a little collection in the pericardial space behind the heart. So JR is a 60-year-old woman who is three months uh, status post anterior heart attack. She's been having constant sharp chest pain for the past two days. No other symptoms. She's not short of breath. She doesn't have any dizziness or lightheadedness, no palpitations, nothing like that. Just this constant sharp chest pain. She's concerned that this may be another heart attack. So she goes to the emergency room. She has a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Temperature's normal. Heart rate's normal. Respiratory rate's normal. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to see, you know, maybe the patient has uh, this inflammation of the heart. And this is the patient who we think about this in. We always think after a heart attack or a heart surgery or something like that, if they have this constant chest pain, then we always think about pericarditis. So this patient had an EKG that showed um, the cardinal signs of pericarditis, which are ST elevations. Notice how these ST segments are elevated above the baseline. But more than that, there's this PR depression. So if we look here in these leads, we can see the normal uh, segment right here across this line. But look how this PR interval is actually, or the PR segment is actually below that baseline. See that? So we call that PR depression. Uh, so general ST elevation in multiple leads that don't make any sense otherwise, and then this PR depression. Those two things together indicate um, a high likelihood of pericarditis. So pericarditis is caused by an inflammatory process. And the thing that causes that inflammatory process can be sometimes cancer, autoimmune syndromes. Uh, in this particular case that I set up with that, um, with that um, patient scenario, this is called post-pericardiotomy syndrome or Dressler's syndrome. This is a well-established thing. A couple weeks after heart attack, particularly of the anterior wall, there's this um, 
rubbing that happens against the pericardium and the front wall of the heart and it causes these uh, symptoms. It's very painful and, uh, and you know we see it with some frequency particularly after heart surgery. Myxedema or severe hypothyroidism uh, can also be a cause of it and then we also worry about uh, infection so syphilis, TB, uh, viral illnesses etc. Again, this is an inflammation of that pericardial sac. When there's an inflammation there and the two surfaces are rubbing together, what can happen? Well, if you rub two things together anywhere in your body, you can get a fluid collection. And so that fluid comes out uh, from the interstitial area and goes into this space and can collect around the heart and if enough of that fluid collects around the heart it can tamponade the heart and remember the tamponade is where you get this excessive buildup of fluid uh, in a confined space and that means that the ventricles can't fill anymore all right it's tamponade is the word don't make this mistake this is cardiac tamponade where you have fluid that builds up around the heart and pushes in on the ventricles and makes it hard for them to fill and as a result the cardiac output is reduced. That's tamponade. This is tamponade. This apparently is delicious. It's made with olives. I'm never going to eat it but I see this sign at Wegmans all the time and it confuses me because I'm thinking tamponade and I'm wondering why they're selling it at Wegmans. They're apparently two different things. So again, this pericardial tamponade is a collection of fluid in the pericardium. Um, if this fluid develops quickly, like a hole in the heart, for instance, it only takes about 50 cc's of blood to tamponade the heart and cause, uh, cause the patient to die. But over a period of time, as in pericarditis, that fluid can collect uh, very very slowly and as a result this thing can get very big and can expand and you can have a whole lot of fluid uh, in that pericardial space. So if it happens acutely it just takes 50 cc's to kill the patient. Over a long period of time, weeks and weeks, that um, the body can adjust to that amount of fluid and um, and it would take a much larger volume to cause pericardial tamponade. Okay, Pulsus paradoxus is um, a physical finding that we see when we examine somebody and that means that uh, ordinarily when you and I take a deep breath our uh, intrathoracic pressure is lower and so our blood pressure goes up a little bit but when you have pulsus paradoxus during inspiration the blood pressure falls and so we can measure that when we uh, examine patients and hopefully you learned about that during your physical exam class although I wouldn't be surprised if you forgot about it because it's one of those little details that's hard to keep in mind. Um, if you're working with somebody in the ICU and they have a Swan-Ganz catheter and other hemodynamic monitoring, what we look for that tells the story of tamponade is this equalization of these pressures. The right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, and the left ventricle pressures all sort of come together and that's a dangerous thing. So the treatment for stable pericarditis is just watching and waiting. So not everybody who has pericarditis gets this cardiac tamponade. So we keep an eye on it and we treat the underlying condition which in this case is inflammation. And how do we treat inflammation? We use NSAIDs, we use steroids, anything that is a um, anti-inflammatory. And then sometimes there's just so much fluid in there that we need to get it out. We take it out, we give them that one time for free so to speak, take it out let it, uh, let it heal, see how it goes, and if that fluid collects again, then we do this thing called a pericardial window, where they cut a hole in the pericardium so that that fluid can drain out uh, and not cause the heart to get uh, constricted. If you have unstable um, cardiac tamponade physiology, then uh, we put a needle in that pericardium, pull out the uh, fluid, 
uh, and then they put a drain in there, usually like a little pigtail catheter or something, just to drain that fluid and keep you from having tamponade. The postpericardiotomy or Dressler syndrome, uh, as I said earlier, is associated with heart surgery and acute MI. It's this continuous sharp stabbing pain. If it's a heart attack, it doesn't last for more than a day, right? Because the heart muscle will die after it doesn't get enough oxygen for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, patients with a heart attack don't have pain anymore because that part of the heart is dead. Um, but with Dressler syndrome, they get this pain all the time. It never goes away. It's very annoying. Um, there's usually not a significant pericardial effusion with this particular one, uh, but sometimes it can happen. All right. And so we said already the treatment is for uh, is to use NSAIDs and sometimes steroids. And that brings us down the home stretch to myocarditis. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart um, muscle itself. So usually this has a very sad story associated with it. So here's one of those sad stories. AB is a 17 year old soccer player who was seen by her primary care physician two weeks ago with upper respiratory uh, symptoms. Her condition continued to worsen and she's now nearly bedridden due to fatigue and dyspnea. Blood pressure is 90 over 50, temperature is 37, heart rate's 100, respiration's 22. She has jugular venous distension, neck veins are elevated. She has bibasilar late inspiratory crackles, and she has a holosystolic murmur at the apex and a third heart sound, that's an S3. Uh, her PMI is laterally displaced, as we see with really big, boggy, baggy hearts, uh, and she has two plus edema in her uh, ankles and extremities. It's a little mean to say, but the etiology of um, this disease, this myocarditis, is just bad luck. There's no other way around it. Lots of us get upper respiratory infections that get better and everything's cool, but every once in a while, somebody gets this common respiratory infection, a viral illness that attacks the heart. And there's no way to predict it. There's no way to know that it uh, is going to happen. There's, you know, you give the same virus, uh, the same viral infection to a thousand people and maybe nobody else gets this heart involvement. It really comes down to bad luck. So the pathophysiology of it is in acute myocarditis, there's this uh, activated natural killer cell that releases all these cytokines. And those cytokines go to the heart muscle and they start attacking the heart muscle itself. That's the way that it works. It's a much more involved process in subacute myocarditis um, where uh, a lot more players uh, are involved. So there's these uh, cardiac dendritic cells and these are the ones that support the myocardiocytes. Uh, T cells produce interleukin, macrophages get involved with tumor necrosis factor and all these things together uh, cause a negative uh, effect on the heart muscle and damage the myocytes. The different infectious agents that have been um, described in myocarditis include these very common um, viruses. So Coxsackie virus, a lot of people get that, uh, adenovirus, HIV, CMV, cytomegalovirus, um, all these viruses that you've probably heard of. Okay. Bacterial infections can also happen, uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae, mycobacterium, salmonella, uh, even staph aureus, and, uh, and some other ones. This uh, treponema pallidum is the organism that causes syphilis. Fungal infections like aspergillus, candida, uh, protozoa in other countries. We don't typically see them here, but it certainly can happen. And then parasites, uh, again, in other third world countries. So the treatment for this is really supportive. There's maximal medical therapy for the heart failure. By the time the heart failure uh, presents, it's too late to give antivirals. 
because they aren't effective. And again, remember, it's not the virus itself that's causing the problem uh, necessarily. In the acute phase it is, but later it's really all this stuff that's the problem. Uh, vasopressors and inotropes are used. So what's a vasopressor? That's a medicine that increases the blood pressure. And an inotrope is a medicine that increases the contractile force of the heart. So it increases the cardiac output. So people are on these medicines like epinephrine and uh, dopamine and dibutamine and medicines like that. Mechanical circulatory support is sometimes necessary. Uh, and sometimes these people end up with heart transplants as well. Okay. Medical therapy for heart failure. Uh, which you've probably talked about multiple times, but I want you to know this list of medicines. Medicines that we use in heart failure include these, and you would be well advised to learn this list, perhaps for maybe a test. So um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, so ARBs are for people who don't tolerate ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers we use for heart failure. Aldactone or aldosterone antagonists we use for um, heart failure. Oops, sorry. Nitrates and vasodilators are sometimes used. We use DIG, although not as much anymore. DIG has kind of fallen on hard times and people don't use it as much anymore. Diuretics don't prolong anybody's life, but what they do is they um, make you feel better. So they get the fluid off. We get the fluid off of people with diuretics. They don't make you live longer like beta blockers do, like aldactone does, like ACE inhibitors do. We know that those prolong your life. We know that diuretics don't prolong your life, but they get the fluid off so you can breathe. And then there's these things called phosphodiesterase inhibitors, or PDE3s. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors um, are medicines that reduce the afterload of the heart to make it easier for the heart to pump blood out, and they increase the contractility so the heart muscle can squeeze more. Okay, And so um, uh, Inacor or Primacor, used to be Inacor, now it's Primacor, uh, is the big phosphodiesterase inhibitor that we use commonly now. Now all of you had uh, a lecture from me uh, in the past about alpha and beta receptors. So hopefully this is a review. In fact, I think I took this exact same slide and put it into uh, the slide that you heard about it in pharmacology with. So remember the alpha-1 uh, receptors cause vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 receptors, when you activate those, that causes vasodilation. But the thing I want you to really focus on right now is the beta-1 and the beta-2. Remember, beta-1, when you increase the beta-1 um, receptors, or when you agonize or, or stimulate the beta-1 receptors, you get increased inotropy, which is contraction force. You increase chronotropy, which means you make the heart rate faster. And you increase dromotropy, and dromotropy means the speed with which the um, conduction goes through the AV node. Okay, so learn those, uh, learn those terms. When we use beta blockers, we decrease the contractility, we decrease the heart rate, and we decrease the speed with which things go through the AV node. All right, so that's beta-1 receptors. Can you think of a time when we would want to use a beta-1 agonist, when we would want to stimulate the beta-1 receptors? Well, if the heart failure is really bad, then sometimes we have to get to that point where we just say, you know what, we've tried to make the heart work less hard, but it's not working, the body needs more, and so now we need to crank up the heart and increase the output, and so we're going to put them on something like dibutamine that will increase their uh, contractility and their heart rate and their AV nodal conduction. Beta-2 receptors, think of one heart, 
beta 1 heart, beta 2 lungs, right? So when you have beta 2 receptors, um, that causes bronchodilation. So agonists, beta 2 agonists, increase um, the diameter of the bronchioles. When we use beta 2 blockers, like certain beta blockers, um, like Indorol, for instance, or Propranolol, those are, um, when you use a beta 2 blocker, then you cause bronchoconstriction. So when we use beta 2 agonists, when we use beta 2 stimulants in the ICU, that actually is very good for the lungs. We love giving epinephrine when we stimulate the beta 2 receptors that causes bronchodilation, which means they get better oxygenation. Okay. Let's uh, look at some of the vasopressors and inotropes that we use in myocarditis and other um, causes of severe heart failure. So isoprel is one of the more common ones that we use, also called isoproteranol. It's a beta 1 and beta 2 agonist, and we use that to increase cardiac output, uh, and it also happens to work uh, in part by decreasing the blood pressure. Norepinephrine uh, is another one. It's an alpha, uh, or this one I should say, is an alpha 1 and beta 1 agonist. It increases blood pressure uh, and increases cardiac output just a little bit. Not really enough to write home about. It's not the first thing that we reach for when we're looking for uh, a medicine to increase cardiac output. It is one of the first ones that we reach for when we're trying to increase the blood pressure though. Dibutamine uh, is another medicine that uh, is an alpha-1 agonist uh, and antagonist. I know it's a little complicated, uh, but it's also a beta-2 agonist. And so we use this to increase cardiac output, and at low doses, uh, it's really a vasodilator. So the way this medicine really works, it increases the cardiac output a little bit by uh, increasing the contractility, but the real way that dibutamine works is by afterload reduction, okay? And then dopamine uh, is another medicine. It really has uh, a couple of different doses. At low dose, it increases renal perfusion, and that's really the only way that we use dopamine. Uh, it's not used as much anymore, but uh, when we use it, we usually use it at low doses to increase renal perfusion. Okay, so these are a couple other slides that really just go through what we've talked about already uh, and help you to understand uh, the dosage. So the dosage here is in mics per kilo per minute. Uh, notice that it's always administered through a central line. Same with dibutamine, mics per kilo per minute. Uh, and always administered through a central line. Now, the take home message here is that, you know, there are a hundred ways to do calculations for drugs. There is only one calculation that you need to memorize, and that's this. If you're a critical care nurse, this calculation will get you through everything. All right, so don't make it hard on yourself. Just plug the numbers in and make it easy. All you have to do is know the ordered amount of the drug. So uh, three mics per kilo per minute, for instance, times the patient's weight in kilos, times the rate of 60 minutes per hour. That's just a given, right? That's gonna be the same thing all the time. And then the drug concentration which is always going to be, in this case, in mics per uh, cc, or mics per mil, right? Because the order is for mics per kilo per minute, so we need the drug concentration to be in micrograms. And all you do is take those numbers that you know, plug them in here, and the result is the result. So learn to do this calculation. See me if you have questions. We can talk about it next week as well uh, in class, and I can give you some uh, examples. Now, if everything goes wrong and we're not successful with the medications, right? So remember I said the first thing we do with medicines is we try and reduce the myocardial oxygen 
demand. We give beta blockers. We lower the blood pressure. We try and make it easy for the heart to do its thing. We reduce everything and take all the um, uh, all the oxygen using things off of the heart. Lower the blood pressure. Lower the contractility. We use beta blockers. It's great. Sometimes that's not good enough. So then we got to change gears and we have to increase the contractility. And we use those medicines like dibutamine and, uh, and, and uh, norepinephrine, medicines like that to try and help their pressure and their cardiac output. Sometimes that's not good enough either. And in those cases, we have to sometimes use what we call an external uh, VAD or a ventricular assist device. And what happens with ventricular assist devices is they uh, increase the um, cardiac output mechanically. So what we do is we put, uh, take the patient to the operating room and we put um, these tubes into the heart that uh, augment the blood pressure and augment the cardiac output. So the blood comes from here from the right side of the heart over to the machine and then um, goes back out uh, to the heart as well. So there's bivads where we help the right heart and the left heart and then there's usually just left ventricular assist devices where we uh, put the uh, put the device uh, in before the, uh, you know, like into the left atrium and then uh, put it into the, put the other end into the aorta and sort of almost bypass the heart, uh, the left ventricle. So the heart still is working, um, but we're giving it some extra help to get the blood circulated. This is a temporary measure. Um, typically we use this when somebody is, um, when somebody's, you know, after a heart attack or they have trouble coming off the heart lung machine, that's when external VADs are used. More than anything, though, for somebody chronically, we would implant a ventricular assist device. And this is one of the VADs uh, that's shown here. And in this case, the, they core out the left ventricle and they insert this um, uh, into the left ventricle. The blood comes out of here, gets uh, sort of a boost through the uh, ventricular assist device, the blood comes back out here and back into the aorta. And so, um, so this helps to uh, augment the cardiac output. Next semester, we're going to have some uh, students in the heart and vascular intensive care unit with me and probably with another instructor. And so there you'll see VADs very frequently. This semester, if you're in the progressive care unit, you may from time to time uh, see patients there who have ventricular assist devices um, as a bridge to transplant, for instance. So that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Um, sorry we didn't get to get together for class, but uh, next week I will see you there. Take care.